Hello, my name is Brian Poole, and I'm a Berlin-based translator working in German, English, and Russian. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present excerpts from my translation work here at New Books in German for the YouTube channel Translations Allowed. The work I'm going to be featuring is Stefan Kreuzberger's The German-Russian Century. The German title is Das Deutsch-Russische Jahrhundert, published by Rovod Verlag in April of this year. That's 2022. A second printing in May has already been required, so it's selling well. Uh, this book is what the Russians affectionately refer to as a kirpich. It's a brick, a tome, uh, over 600 pages, 100 pages of which are footnotes and uh, bibliography. It is thus impossible to summarize the volume or to reflect its detail by reading from a single chapter on German-Russian history. More important, I think, is to focus on why Kreuzberger's study responds to a series of blind spots in the current transatlantic debates on Russia today. This despite the fact that Kreuzberger's study was written and completed before Putin launched his full-scale invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February. Quite simply, Kreuzberger's volume offers a contextualization of developments between Germany and Russia that led us to where we are today. But the author also ventured to express an assessment of what conclusions ought to be drawn for future policy based on his decades of experience in the field. And it is to these statements that I turn in my translation of excerpts from Kreuzberger's The German-Russian Century. This from the final chapter entitled The German-Russian Century, A Balance Sheet with Options. Despite efforts that have been crowned with success, the bilateral relationship at the end of the German-Russian century is not in good shape. The Kremlin is now using political practices and rhetoric that bring back memories of the Cold War's frostiest era. For some time now, Vladimir Putin has been systematically flouting the generally accepted rules of orderly diplomatic interaction. He is staging foreign policy solo acts for example, the annexation of Crimea in violation of international law and the war in eastern Ukraine in an attempt to restore his country's imperial greatness. At the same time, the Russian president is systematically modernizing his weapons arsenal, including nuclear weapons, and he doesn't shrink from using cyber war tactics. Russia has thus once again become a serious military threat. On the other hand, in re recent years, the Bundeswehr, the German army, has been neglected to such an extent that it is scarcely able to defend itself, and Germany remains unwilling to spend 2% of its gross domestic product annually on defense, despite its political declarations of intent in 2014 at the NATO summit in Wales. For that reason, the Germans ought to make decisive improvements to their security policy. In view of such realities, there can be no simple return to previous phases of German-Russian normality, at least for the time being. The modernization partnership practiced by Germany since 2007 is dead. The assumption that Russia would allow itself to be moved towards democratization and the rule of law under Putin has proven to be false. The Kremlin elite is pursuing a completely different policy. It continuously strives to systematically disorientate its own population with misinformation about Germany and Western Europe, even to instill fear and terror in them. Putin runs his state with an authoritarian hand. In this logic, he sees himself as far superior to countries with a democratic constitution, such as the Federal Republic of Germany. For Putin, these countries are weak in leadership and decision-making, which explains his contempt for democracy. In this overestimation of himself, however, he fails to recognize Germany's influential position within NATO and the European Union. And this position could prove an advantage or a disadvantage for his rule, depending on the decisiveness with which the German government acts within the Western alliance structures in the future. When, in 2014, at the height of the Ukraine crisis, Chancellor Merkel became the driving force of the EU for sanctions imposed on the Russian Federation, 
Her decisiveness may have surprised Vladimir Putin, although, at closer glance, these consequences were already apparent. This course should be maintained unwaveringly as long as the Russian president shows no flexibility and no understanding. Under no circumstances can the violation of international law be tacitly accepted or rewarded by irresponsible concessions. This would send the wrong signals if we want to be taken seriously as Putin's negotiating partner. Above all, it is important not to succumb to Moscow's threatening gestures without resistance or to allow ourselves to be weakened within the alliance and the EU by Russian attempts at division. Demonstrating firmness and remaining defensive, these are the highest priorities for which there are eloquent examples in the history of German-Soviet relations during the Cold War. We need only recall the first Berlin crisis in 1948 and 1949, or the Soviet Berlin ultimatum between 1958 and 1961, which culminated in the construction of the Berlin Wall on the 13th of August 1961. Hasty political reactions, such as the Franco-German-Russian initiative at the EU summit on the 24th of June 2021, tend to be counterproductive. Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron's unexpe unexpected proposal to offer President Putin the prospect of a summit at the highest level without any advance concessions was met with firm rejection not only by the Eastern European member states of the community, Merkel and Macron would have been well advised to include the 27 EU member states early on in their deliberations instead of giving them the impression of Franco-German know-it-allism. Calling on Germany to act decisively in regard to the Russian Federation does not mean advocating an ill-considered exchange of blows that would only escalate the current crisis unnecessarily and it is certainly not intended to revive the Cold War era. Rather, future policy towards Russia should always be linked to making the Kremlin aware of the advantages and disadvantages of cooperating with or turning away from Germany and the West. This, too, is reflected in the experiences of the past German-Russian century. In the end, the flourishing economic cooperation always benefited both sides. Even if Moscow seems to ignore it today, a prolonged course of confrontation will ultimately shift the balance to Russia's disadvantage because the Russian economic model is not sustainable. In the three decades following the end of the Soviet Union, no sustainable economic infrastructure has been built. Exporting energy and raw materials alone cannot help overcome such inadequacies. Moreover, challenges are piling up, both with regard to climate change and in the fight against the current corona pandemic, and such challenges cannot be overcome by going it alone. The ruling Russian elite is currently trying to compensate for this. They are playing the, Russian, uh, the Chinese card, striving for special relations with the economically superior neighbor, but they fail to realize that Russia would only be a junior partner in such a relationship. In view of the overall intensification of global competition, not to mention Beijing's rigorous policy of interests, in the long run, Russia would be better off returning to multilateral economic cooperation with the far more predictable Germans and the democratic West. For the German-Russian century has also revealed this. Alliances with authoritarian regimes have always been temporary marriages of convenience. Finally, German policy towards Russia should bear one thing in mind. Nothing lasts forever. Who would have believed more than three decades ago that the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Empire would leave the political stage in such short order? In this respect, it seems sensible not to limit efforts towards Russia to Vladimir Putin and his leadership team. Rather, wherever possible, it is also important to develop contacts with political circles and personalities who are open to cosmopolitan civil society dialogue.
for they are the potential bearers of hope and thus the contact persons for a post-Putin era. Thank you.